There's an important lesson I learned when studying data visualization, and that's that the purpose of any visualization is to convey information to your audience. Nothing more, nothing less. It's not meant to be pretty. It's not meant to show off technology. It's there to inform. And all of that is also true about model interpretability. If we're going to go the extra mile, maybe some of you wouldn't say it's the extra mile that it's required in cases, but if we're going to do model interpretability, make an effort to do that, it needs to be useful. People who have questions about a model or are perhaps affected by a model will want to know how that model works. So naturally, we'd like to have the perspective of a lot of industry professionals. What are they using and in what context? <laughs> This week I speak with Ray Hong about the paper, Human Factors in Model Interpretability, Industry Practices, Challenges, and Needs. Diehard data skeptic fans may already be aware. For anyone playing data skeptic bingo, let's definitely check your card. Ray's co-authors Jessica Holman and Enrico Bertini are previous guests on Data Skeptic, so we got the triple play here. That's only happened twice, and today's the second time. My name is Songsu Ray Hong, and I go by Ray. And I'm an assistant professor at George Mason University, Information Science and Technology. I'm mostly interested in the human factors or human community interaction whenever we are designing the system. And nowadays, my focus is how we can actually better leverage machine learnings in determining the insights or just working with machine learnings to make some creative tools. So like human in the loop and then human AI collaborations, but more centered toward putting the human first is my research agenda. When I was in grad school, I took an intro to HCI course. So obviously a, an overview, but we talked about a broad spectrum of neat stuff like user interface design and that kind of thing. Yours is the first time I've heard machine learning interpretability kind of put in an HCI context. Could you elaborate on how it fits into the umbrella of things that are in HCI? Yes. Yeah, so HCI is just like the discipline to understand the human first and then designing the interactive interface later. I think whenever we think that building some very simple application, we kind of often think that it is very easy to just design the things because we think that the users like needs are pretty explicit. But whenever we talk with the people who use and then you realize that there are so many hidden design requirements and system requirements. So we really, really just like think that it is important for understanding the human first or their kind of the needs first in our formative study. I think that's the one of the understanding part of the HCI. Then based on that understanding, now we can actually develop some tools in the right direction. And then this is now a designing study. So in HCI, people typically do the user research. They are mostly focusing on the understanding part. And then UX researcher or the data scientist, they are mostly related to the builder part. But altogether, these should be closely tied together. We have to understand using the formative study, and then we have to now evaluate just like the tool with the summative study. Those are kind of the two things that is, should be anchored in our new development of the tools. So when I was in postdoc while working with Enrico Bertini and then Jessica Holman, I think that our focus was now what's going on in the model interpretability. So actually, there are a lot of people who are focusing on human in the loop and human AI collaborations in HCI nowadays, just like other fields. And then our emphasis is that, well, it's great that we can actually understand and predict a lot of different things with the last effort. But when we are using or leveraging these new knowledges, using the machine learning and everything, if we don't understand what's going on there, and then that's useless. So how we can deliver this information in a way that we can organize and understand and the leverages in the knowledge discovery and then also so distance making is something that we were actually focusing on. So it was like more like formative study to understand what we can do in the future when we help like the data scientists or the other like the stakeholders such as like program managers or even just like casual users to use machine learning models. What can we do in the future type of stuff? So we're excited to move forward to the next phase of a new tool development nowadays. So that bridges very nicely into the main paper we wanted to discuss today, Human Factors in Model Interpretability, Industry Practices, Challenges, and Needs. Outlined a bit of what you sought out to research in doing these interviews, but could you talk a little bit about some of the, I don't know, design challenges or ways in which you guys pulled the study together? Well, so in many people in the information visualization, when they are designing some interactive systems for the data scientist, they have some difficulties in terms of determining the design requirement of the system. And they 
that is because they sometimes have a lack of context. So for example, we were actually doing a lot of interviews with many people. And then one of our participants say, it is completely useless to see all of these kinds of the things that's really published in the academic research. Sometimes it's not everything. Of course, there's a really great tools that they can use, but many of these are also in her term is useless. And then what we want to just really just understand was that in which context people use the model interpretability. Context is important because depending on the context, the type of the information or the task goal or like how they can communicate with their outcome with the other people, the stakeholders, they're all different. So our focus was to understand the context first, how industry practitioners actually used a model interpretability tool with whom, who, and then uh, when, and then for what, those type of things. And I think that if we understand these things better, then we can also identify what types of the difficulties or the problems or challenges that they are having. So we also try to focus on tending their needs, like opportunities, what can be done in the future for helping the data scientists or the field to more just better leverage these uh, interactive tools in just like collaborating with the machine learnings in general. And tell me a little bit about the participants. What sort of background? did they come from? Yeah, I guess that was uh, one of the challenging parts that we just recruit the participants who work with the model interpretability and have some kind of difficult issues. It was not that just very difficult to uh, meet with the data scientists per se, but the more people took just like closely working with the model interpretability. So our data scientists are professional, like the data scientists who are mostly working in the machine learning models. And then their models can be sometimes like white box models or black box models, all of the different kind of the stuff. And not surprisingly, each of the data scientists experience multiple machine learning projects. Sometimes they're doing the linear regression. Sometimes they're doing like the black box, the deep neural network or CNN or RNN. Those are all type of the different types of the models, but they had a good kind of experience in terms of working with the machine learning models. They also had this model interpretable issue. It is not new that just now people really just care about the model interpretability. Our participants are mostly having that issues because uh, many of them, they're kind of making the model for the doctors to understand whether we have to do the lung cancer operations or not type of a very serious problem or who we have put uh, first in emergency room type of stuff. So that situation was pretty critical sometimes. Or their model has been used by multiple millions of like daily active users in like the huge social network services. So failing at that decision or interpreting their research in the wrong way can actually make them high stake like the failure situation. They were pretty serious about this like modern interpretability issues. And, and we were really, really pleased that we had an opportunity to chat with them to understand the modern interpretability issue. And amongst those people, uh, were there any commonalities? What was the consensus thinking? What things did people all have in common from a point of view of model interpretability? Yeah, I guess maybe two things. So the first thing was that uh, they were mostly focusing on edge cases. Whenever they just actually talk about like model interpretability, what they try to do is to see the visualizations and graph and then see what's different from my expectation. That was kind of the commonality. Almost everyone said that. So the model interpretability is like detecting some edge cases, first of all, and then understanding why these edge cases can happen here. Is it something that my misunderstanding of the situation or the data? We just trained the model in a different way than we expected. Another one was that I think the data scientists are collaborators. They are just like working with a lot of people, no exception, almost everyone. They had to actually discuss about this machine learning model interpretability research with other people. And often the case that can be the professional machine learning engineers, the people who know everything, like the local, Glover, Bradcam, Sharp Lime. They know everything and then they have to just discuss about these things. And also sometimes they were non-professional machine learning researchers, like different stakeholders, aka domain experts, which they have to just closely work together to build the models in general, especially in the bank and then maybe like the hospital situation. I think that there are a lot of different situations. They just work together with people who have some less knowledge about the machine learning. But the communication seemed pretty like very difficult issues. And I think that the maybe Emiko and Jessica may just like cover this but the visualization was pretty important in this sense. So there's actually more than I thought in common. There's some surprising commonalities there. How much variance and difference did you see across the various people's needs and applications? Yeah, I guess those parts were just common, but then there were also some different viewpoints. Uh, for example, model interpretability in the black box model. Nowadays, people are using some grad cam or like BART or other non-model agnostic local methods to interpret just a black box models. 
neural network mostly. And some people believe that oh, those are important things that we want to have. We want to have some more like the global model interpretation methods for this type of black box models. But we know that this is almost like nearly impossible how we can reason and then track their neural networks, logical structure in terms of how they make the prediction. It's not that easy. But still people just needed it. They want to, for example, apply this high performing black box models in their critical situations such as bank loan bankers. They talked a lot about this, like the black box models, how they can actually linear regression models applying the black box models. So, but then also the people who are just professionally working on this like neural network and then just black box model, they kind of feel it's a little bit skeptical, but uh, there are a lot of approaches nowadays in human computer interaction and information visualization fields for giving them some more of like the global sense of how the black box models just make the prediction. So I guess uh, that was an interesting diverging opinions. So I think it's very interesting to see what we can do with this kind of area as well. I think that it is very just understandable that the professional people who work with this like neural network, they think that it is not that easy to understand what's going on completely using the visualization because in ICI, we are always talking about people's attention and their like the memory span. It is not going to be possible for people to store all of the information that is required for understanding the neural network's behavior. But still, I guess uh, there can be some more interaction modality, that's we call the way that we can present to the users and that partially understand what's going on depending on their query. And I think that the sharp and lime, they're doing this approach in the local method case based. But indeed, I think that the people are also just trying to make some better interactive tool that shows the patterns rather than the case by case kind of explanation. But we actually did specify this in the paper because Whenever we are writing this paper, we should just present the major patterns that has been discussed by the majority of the participants. That's the way that we write up the qualitative results. In terms of the deployment, I've been very curious about the stages companies are at. Certainly, it's going to take time for ideas of interpretability to roll out and become part of a large organization. And I guess that starts with the data scientists saying, hey, everybody, this is important. We want to do more of this. And then getting manager approval and executive approval. And then, it, I don't know, they adopt a tool. It gets into a pipeline. And maybe at the horizon, the customer service team is even somehow involved because they know how to interact with these things. Maybe everyone's shooting for that. I doubt if many people have hit the goal yet. Where are most people on that journey? How sophisticated have they got in their adoption of these ideas? Well, so when we are talking about the stages, I think that was explicit. There were not many differences between the people, but in many cases, I think that the data scientists were the kind of the leader of determining what types of features that we want to include in there. But they have to transfer the domain experts like the terms and then the way that they talk into the specific number in the, as a like a feature, for example. But then I guess that stage was absolutely important for the organizations to decide whether we want to adopt these machine learning models or not. And I think that the model interpreted tool was acting as a major vehicle for just establishing the trust. So, well, let's say the decision maker for deciding on whether we want to apply these machine learning models in our product or not, if they understand what's going on and what types of the risks are there, is this the risk-free machine learning models or is it actually improving their business operations in terms of efficiency and effectiveness, then they may likely to accept. Yeah, there can be some political reasons just like chime in and then make the process a little bit difficult. But I think that in general, nowadays, people are just like, every day, everybody, almost everybody knows that it's like general tendency that they have to just follow. So I guess uh, people are pretty soft on accepting this machine learning stuff nowadays. But I think that the consensus is very important and then explaining their research to the different stakeholders was absolutely very important. In terms of that process, I think that the first stakeholder, who is just a domain expert, they make this kind of data dictionary, what they call, what types of features are relevant in building this model. Data scientists have to actually work with other people, we found. So just like collaboration between the other people were very essential. And then all of those things are reported to, in general, the risk officer. I think they're just mostly covering these legal issues and so forth. And then there's another type of the different uh, modern interpretability issue, whether you are including some of the features that can be very sensitive or violating individual people's privacy or something like that. And I guess once just people make an agreement in terms of, oh yeah, now I think that we have a good data dictionary in terms of building this model. And then there may be, okay, the level of the legal issues. Now we like go on. 
The second stage was the building the machine learning model. I think this is more like conventional way of model interpretability where the data scientists used a very professional toolkit for doing the model interpretability stuff. And then the interesting part in here was that in many cases, data scientists has to work with the data engineers who are actually building this data streamline and pipeline. And then there were a lot of the back and forth issues in terms of like communication. And then after all, now they build the, all of these machine learning models. Now the prototype has been built and then every one just agree that at least the developer team now this is ready to go then now it's like moment of the deployment and also there's a data scientist and then data engineers they're just like closely working together to check everything is working okay that type of stuff after the deployment still there's a lot of interpretable issues because the data always change the flow the features can change and then changing just one single feature can be very very difficult for people and sometimes they want to actually improve their machine learning models using the different model base and that seemed a very just big decision. So even just academic researchers think that the linear regressions or like rudimentary guide of machine learning models that we think this is easy to implement, it's done. But actually in reality, even the very simplistic machine learning model are maintaining all these models and then just overseeing what's going on in all of these different paces is a lot of work. Any institution that we just like talk through, they maintain a really large group of people for even just one single machine learning model that seems very easy to implement from the standpoint of the academia. Thanks to this week's sponsor, the Springboard Data Science Career Track. The Data Science Career Track is similar to online boot camps, but the real difference is that it's project-based. So while you're learning methodology, you're applying it and building up your portfolio. That's key. Every open position for a data scientist or similar engineer, I expect a GitHub link with something on it. Every student in the program is paired with a data science expert who provides unlimited one-on-one mentorship to support your unique needs. You'll need a basic understanding of Python or another modern object-oriented programming language and some problem probability and statistics. And best of all, Springboard offers a job guarantee for all their career tracks. This means you don't have to pay for the program until you secure a job in the data science space. Data skeptic listeners have access to an exclusive offer. There are scholarships of up to $500 for eligible applicants. Make sure to enter the code DATA SPRINGBOARD, all caps, no spaces, when you enroll at springboard.com. There are 20 scholarships available for students who enroll. See how to qualify and apply. It takes just 10 minutes. Take the next step in your data science career. Head over to springboard.com and it's data springboard for the code. So in terms of tool adoption, what's out there now? What is the level of sophistication of the things people can adopt, I don't know, off the shelf or maybe commercially or just bring into their stack to do some model interpretability? I think that it depends on the type of the machine learning models that they're working on. I guess many people use some enterprise type of tool, let's say Amazon SageMaker or maybe Azure Machine Learning Studio, that type of stuff. And also there can be a lot of PyTorch center type of the development. I think that many of the data scientists use the PyTorch and everything. Also the kind of thing that we identified is that when people are making the model that will be shipped to their product and then when they care about the performance and then accuracy, there's a lot of just complicated recipe each of the team build. They are doing a lot of ensembling of the different machine learning models and making the decision, even just making the advertisement ranking systems and then machine learning model interpretability tool is actually based on a lot of kind of different factors. So it's just not simplistic at all. And then after all, because people are just like combining so many different types of models within like the one kind of decision-making pipeline, they even say it's very difficult to understand what's going on. That was pretty much of like big challenges in machine learning model interpretability. Is there one standout complaint that the practitioners have? If they could all get together and come to consensus on the thing that we should all fix first, what's that biggest hurdle or is there one? I think that the, one of the common hurdles that we identified was scalability issue, actually. So people wanted to actually, for example, understand when in the first phase of uh, building the machine learning models in the ideation phase, and then the many of the data scientists and then the domain experts actually just discussed, like, should you have to add this one or not adding this one or how we can combine all of these things? Should you have to bin this one or should you have to quantize this kind of quantitative measure? What can we do? There are a lot of kind of decision making happens in terms of fixing all of this, like the bolts and nuts of this feature. But then the problem is that they don't know the implications and because of the scalability. Now we are just talking about like the trillions of the data just like, you know, flowing in the pipeline. And then of course, it is not going to be that easy to understand their decision making pipeline. So what they're doing is to just like shift a little bit and then train the model. And then uh, it takes maybe a few days and then they just try to find, oh, so actually that was good or that was bad. 
and then they cannot actually just compare like multiple different models like because of this scalability issue. So many people said this is the hold. They want to make the best decision in terms of making the model, but because of this scalability issue, they cannot actually do a lot of back and forth communication with the machine learning model. I guess people are just doing a lot of approaches for approximating or just like making the small scale of the machine learning models and then just like help people to compare and then interact in the real time. But still, it's not that easy. So I guess the first hurdle that we identified was like making the bridge between the ideation phase and then the building the phase. They should be somewhat just like closely tied together. One of the sections of the paper identifies uh, design opportunities for interpretability challenges. Could you share some of your thoughts discussed there? So we had a couple of like opportunities and then some of them were actually covered, but we had uh, four types of the opportunities. The first one was representing the human expectations. And Kai, I remember that we were talking about this, the superstition of the customer. This was very, very interesting thought to me. So people are just talking about the machine learning model interpretability is just to determine the edge cases. That means that it always involves the human expectation. You have some expectation and then see the results. And then because you have expectation, there is like edge cases that's different from your expectation. And they were just like talking about how they elicit their expectation and then more easily see the differences between their expectations and then the complicated machine learning behavior. So some certain degree of like the level of the abstractions in terms of eliciting my expectations and then showing the differences should be done. But sometimes many people say it was a very rigorous process. People have to spend a lot of time on just indicating the ideas and then just see the patterns of the machine learning model behavior. Let's say that people see the differences between their expectations and model's behavior and who is right. That's also a very difficult problem. I and mean, maybe that's more leaning toward the data actually just explain the fact. But some also say, well, what if this pattern is really against the common sense? Then who is right? So one of the interviewees uh, working at Google, she was actually talking about some case of making the machine learning models for expecting lawyers to the bar exam success ratio. And then when they just trained this machine learning model, and then they found if the GPA is like higher, then they may tend to have a lower acceptance rate in the bar. And then that doesn't make sense how this can happen. So their GPA are kind of a high grading in classes shouldn't actually harm, but sometimes the model like, show this type of way. And then she thinks that there's something that they have to do to regulate this kind of general patterns that is against the common sense. Maybe that could be some hidden variable too. I'm reminded of a curious result that happens in a lot of like publications on weight, where if you look at people who drink soda or drink diet soda and then exercise or not, it can look as though diet soda is very bad for you. But if you include the group of people who don't drink anything at all in comparison, actually, you know, and be healthy, there's a correlation there of like lack of exercise and general unhealth. So you have to find that correlation. Maybe it can be surprising and counterintuitive, but yeah, it could be there in the data. Who knows? It really? Is. Who knows? That's so kind of the big difficulties. There can be some hidden variables, as you said, and then some of the input of the data instances that they were using for training was biased, for example. I guess in that case, machine learning prediction patterns can be very different from our common sense Then what they can do is very difficult. So many people also talked about like this uh, cognitive dissonance type of metrics. So it's a very just simplistic way of dealing with the case when we see the different expectation. But let's say the machine learning model predict this is true or false. And then also just human thinks that this is true or false. And then if human thinks this is true and machine learning thinks this is true, and then now they're agreeing, so there's no problem. But then if the machine learning models say false and then just like human just, just see this is true or vice versa, now then just, there's a disagreement between the machine learning models and humans. And then I guess in that case, it is very difficult for them to rely on machine learning model interpretability research. Otherwise, they were not going to be able to accept why this agreement happens and why should I have to accept this? And then the interesting part is that machine learning thinks that this is false and the human made the decision it is false. Both are false, but they're just agreeing. And then now it's completely unobservable. But then what's happening in the case? So maybe people will be able to understand afterward, oh yeah, this was a bad kind of decision. It was wrong. It's very difficult to detect all of those issues as well. There's a couple points in the paper where you'll pull together different ideas. Like I recall at one section I highlighted in which different participants responded and talked about like a root cause or a decision boundary or a global structure. And that, I mean, I guess if I wanted to write a long blog post, I could compare and contrast how all those things are different, but they're kind of all the same thing in some 
sense, yet with very different wording. And even though model interpretability is not totally new, it's a, a topic in motion, a lot of research going on. Is it maybe too soon for organizations to adopt methods or anything like that because things could be evolving quickly? Well, in terms of this decision boundary and the root cause, I think that model interpretability tool can actually show the decision boundary, but actually it is a human's role to understand whether this is the reason of the root cause or not. So there can be a slight kind of difference between the decision boundary and the root cause. In terms of like whether people will actually adopt all of this, uh, the important part is that data scientists adopt their own way, whatever they need. They have a very specific type of the machine learning model that they want to build, and then they are just searching all of their the state-of-the-art kind of techniques that's published in the paper and then just released in GitHub. There's a limited selections in terms of what types of communication, kind of visualizations or the methods that the data scientists can adopt to present the insights to the other stakeholders, such as like model breakers, let's say, like the domain experts, for example, who just like work with them to determine what can be the important features in the machine learning store when they just actually use these machine learning models to make the decisions, what can they trust or what cannot trust or something like that. The data scientists have difficulties in terms of deciding what to show. We know about this kind of the course of knowledge, data scientists know everything, but then the other stakeholders doesn't know what's going on in general. So even if they say, oh, this is something that just like is happening, and then they explain their uh, the knowledges to the other kind of the different stakeholders, then they don't know what's going on. But then in many cases, they think that the feature-centered explanation is pretty useful. This is aligning with the findings in the human computer interaction and information visualization. Multidimensional reasoning is very, very difficult based on the limited human cognitive ability. Well, they can just actually just scope down to the one feature and then explaining those things or just like presenting the two features at most and then just show the patterns and then general kind of the stuff. That was useful. And also maybe another way was the example-based uh, explanation. But then the problem is that, for example, they use the sharp in line and then present this like local method to the other stakeholders. That's the kind of the interesting cases that may make sense, but like how actually just the machine learning model make the decision that doesn't actually give the global presentation of a global kind of the picture of how actually just machine learning model make the decision. That was, uh, people said, this is limited. It's not going to be that for uh, convincing other stakeholders. Uh, that was uh, their common difficulties. If they're fortunate and then they're working in the white box model, they say they feel like this isn't a tree well or like the rules that those are reasonably just good enough for just like other stakeholders to understand so i guess those are kind of the typical visualization methods that the data scientists adopt when just explaining these tools but when they're just going beyond there and they found it is very very difficult well we've talked a lot about uh, the research you did on other people's research let's transition a bit and talk about your own research what are the kinds of questions you're posing now in your new position First of all, we are really, really interested in just focusing on the data preparation phase nowadays. So machine learning model is based on the data. And then in just building the data, there are a lot of like the factors that the different people just work together. And then this is what we call a CSCW or computer supported cooperative work type of dimension. Uh, it's kind of also related to the social computing. So how we can just uh, design this data labeling user interface or environment in a way that the group of people can more easily collaborate. And then also when they actually do this collaboration to establish these data types and the data sources, how they can just be able to understand the aftermath of the, their decision in just like this dimension or that dimension, comparing this like the machine learning models, like, you know, simultaneously, you know, reasonable time. So that's one of the stuff that we are mostly interested in. Now we have this uh, machine learning outcome. Now let's say that just like decision maker is using this machine learning model. I guess that cognitive dissonance is kind of interesting. So how do we know how people actually just like make the decisions, accept or reject the machine learning model's prediction outcome based on which ground and then which cases in which design they make the right decision and the wrong decision and how we can actually better improve the way they actually just like make the decisions using the outcome of the machine learning models. It's actually very, very interesting. So I guess uh, that's another aspect. And then the later part is about research methodology. That means for the data scientist tool, data scientists just work really back and forth using this uh, data science tool to understand what's going on. That's what we call exploratory task. There's no ground truth. There's no goal. 
they are just like, you know, working with the system interactively and then just like what types of insights they identify, like what types of the kind of things that they just learn, what types of the things incorporate in their knowledge. That's a very just difficult problem for evaluation because you don't know. Like, let's say in the like conventional sense of human computer interaction, let's say because of the one data scientist finished their task within the short amount of time. So this is efficient. But if you're just going to the exploratory kind of the realm, then the short kind of task completion time or the short use of the system, fewer interactions step that people use to finish their task doesn't just like tell that the system was successful. It's a difficult problem when we just like understand, uh, oh yeah, this tool actually just give them some kind of you know, better outcome. And this system gave them the last kind of, you know, last. How we can actually determine this, like related to determining the research methodology for evaluating this exploratory system. Nowadays, I think they're very, very closely related to what they learn. And then I think that whether the learning was actually useful or not useful, or whether the design of the system actually in intrigue the data scientists to just go to the deeper and deeper and deeper and then help them to determine the quality kind of the insights. It's all about the learning and insights, I think. So I think that it can be interesting to understand how we can measure data scientists' use of the system in a way that it can facilitate their learning, uh, determining the insights or something. So yeah, those are the three big directions. Well, Ray, where can people follow you online? I started using the Twitter nowadays. So it's like underscore Ray underscore home. <laughs> Can't get enough of Data Skeptic? Well, you're in luck. We have a brand new podcast with Kyle from Data Skeptic called Data Skeptic Journal Club. Hi, I'm George, and I'm a recent graduate in data science from London. Hi, I'm Lan. I'm a neuroscientist turned data scientist working in a biotech startup in Oregon. Journal Club is a panel show where myself, George, and Kyle all come together to discuss various news articles, academic papers, and journal articles every Wednesday. This week, I brought along a story from MIT Technology Review about Google Health's trial to detect blindness in Thailand. This week, I brought a news item about determined AI open sourcing their AI infrastructure platform. We would love for you to join us every Wednesday in our discussion at Data Skeptic Journal Club. Thanks for listening to Data Skeptic Interpretability. Our guest today was Ray Hong. Our theme song is Number 5 by Big D and the Kids Table. Claudia Armbruster is our associate producer. Vanessa Bersiaga does guest coordination. And I've been your host, Kyle Polich. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on.